This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Making Leadership Work. It's a study of leadership, and we do this at uh, 2 o'clock on Monday, every Monday. Uh, and uh, today we're talking about leadership uh, with respect to the Jones Act, uh, making leadership work with respect to the Jones Act. And whenever we think of the Jones Act, we think of Mike Hansen <laughs> and the Shippers Council. Welcome right. to the show, Mike. Thank you, Jay. I'm glad to be back here again. Yeah, nice to have you. So uh, recently there was, um, was an, an op-ed piece, was it, by uh, one of the principals of the SIU uh, dealing with the Jones Act. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's uh, Michael Sacco. He's president of the uh, Siemens International Union of North America, uh, which is affiliated, for example, with the Marine uh, firemen who work the engine rooms on mats and in many of the vessels in the Pacific, and also the Sailor Union of the Pacific, which are the guys on deck. How about the AMO? Uh, AMO is also affiliated with ESIU. That's the American Maritime Officers. Officers, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, set it up first, we have to know that uh, Senator McCain, U.S. Senator McCain, reintroduced his Open America Waters Bill again. So it's the Open America Waters Bill of uh, 2017. And he introduced that in, in July, was it? In July. Yeah. And Michael Sacco wrote his op-ed in, uh, in August. Mm -hmm. so the okay. beginning so this of is August. all very current then. Oh, sure. And what is McCain's bill? McCain's bill would eliminate what's known as the uh, U.S. domestic ship build requirement of the Jones Act and other maritime legislation. I mean, the Jones Act only a, it strictly applies to, to cargo, but then there's uh, le similar legislation for passengers, uh, towing, dredging, salvage, ex fishing. And it all has the same requirement. Exactly. And those same. requirements are got to be built, built in the United States, got to be flagged in the United States, got to have a United States crew. Right. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. And U.S. ownership. Of, of course. So, and uh, there's another requirement for most of the commercial vessels. They also have to have a designated uh, U.S. Coast Guard uh, licensed officer as the so-called manager of the vessel. Okay. That's not hard, though. That's, that's yeah. easy. Anyone yeah. can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone with a license, anyway. Yeah. Um, but what McCain has uh, proposed, and this is, he, uh, this is a reintroduction of the same bill that he first introduced in 2010. And then in 2015, he attempted to attach this to the Keystone uh, Pipeline Authorization Bill. What's it got to do with the Keystone Pipeline Authorization? Nothing. Nothing. But that's the way it works. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> right. it, that was unsuccessful. And then uh, the following year, in 2016, he attempted to attach a, uh, a measure that was similar but would only apply to tankers to the energy bill, which was germane. It's, it's it. germane yeah. to that. Yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm beginning to get the impression that McCain wants to change the Jones Act, the Passenger Services Act, and all those acts you mentioned, which are, let's call them for this discussion, the Jones Act group. Okay? Right. Um, and he wants to change it in only one particular. It's the shipbuilding requirement. Right. He wants to soften the requirement that all these ships, in order to qualify for the intercoastal trade, um, be manufactured, be built in the U.S. That's correct, yeah. Okay, but the other, the other requirements would still stand. Would remain the, the same, Flagged yes. in, the, in the United States, um, crew in the United States, owned in the United States right. by U U.S. owners. Right. Of course, the, uh, just to dwell on ownership for a minute, and my goodness, with um, the various corporate uh, schematics, you can own things uh, uh, in ways that people don't fully understand. You can, you can have somebody far, far away, like a Russian, for example, for example through he, various proxy sure. corporations, own an American ship. Easy, no problem. Yeah. Uh, that's true in a certain sense. I mean, take, for example, Matson, publicly traded company, owner of 25 or 26 vessels, depending upon how you count them, Jones Act vessels. Now, 
how does Madsen know that all of its shareholders are citizens? Doesn't. <laughs> of course not. And uh, there was a, uh, a publication written uh, a couple of years ago by some uh, very knowledgeable maritime lawyers in Washington, D.C. on this whole subject, and it runs over 100 pages. <laughs> we don't have time for that. In terms, of, <laughs> in terms of all the, the ways one might go about proving Got that it. a vessel is, in fact, citizen Got owned. It. So that's, that's a little amorphous, that one. Um, built in the United States uh, will, will mean that you've got you to be built in a shipyard. And I remember in the case of the Monterey, if you remember the Monterey, they took it to uh, the shipyard in, uh, in Finland, uh, the national shipyard in Finland, which is, I don't think, anymore. Wartsila, Wartsila yeah. was the national shipyard. And they, and they put a section of steel in the Monterey to uh, make it longer. Okay? And then there was a question that the Coast Guard dealt with, that is, how many feet? of the section, the it, extension it, it, section. It, it has to do with steel weight. Steel weight, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, there's, a, there's a Coast Guard office in West Virginia right. that does nothing but these issues. Steel weight. Yes. Yeah. And, um, they found that there was enough steel from Finland in there to make it a non-U.S. hull. Right. And that was really sloppy work on the part of the naval architect. Because they could have avoided that. Sure. Had they designed it in such a way that it wouldn't exceed the rules. Yeah. Now, anyway, that's the build rule. And, yeah, and that's uh, very important because right now, uh, Madsen just got finished doing foreign uh, refit work on three of their vessels that are employed in the Alaska trade. They had to meet new uh, emissions requirements. And one of the ways you can do that is by putting uh, what's uh, certain uh, uh, scrubbers on, on, your, on your vessel. They took their ships to China, all three of them, you know, rotated them uh, into China mm -hmm. and did the work there. They got a letter from the Coast Guard prior to doing the work saying that this would meet the, would be within the limits that are, that are set forth. For the emissions. Yeah. Right. But and, and most of it, and it went, went far. It worked. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And they actually, Matson got an extra voyage out of it from the f Far East <laughs> to the U.S. Everybody wins. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese, too. <laughs> uh, and now the, uh, the more current one is that um, uh, Pasha, uh, Pasha uh, Hawaiian Transport Line, has got, just recently got uh, a letter that uh, they're proposing to do quite a lot of work on two of their ships, the Pacific and the, and the uh, Enterprise, uh, at a Chinese shipyard. And they need to re-engine the ships and do a number of things to qualify to, to uh, uh, meet requirements. And their steel weight is just under what the limit is. And so they'll be able to accomplish all this work there in China it will not be considered to be rebuilt in a foreign place, so it will still have its Jones Act so eligibility. Uh, the letter of the law. And on top of that, uh, there's an old provision from the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariff that imposes uh, its, uh, foreign, its uh, duties on foreign repairs. There's a 50% ad valorem duty on foreign repairs. Including shipbuild repairs. Oh, sure. And extensions like this. <laughs> so the, the owner, when that ship returns from the Far East at its first port of entry, they have to make an entry with customs <laughs> stating how, how expensive the repairs were and tender a check equal to 50% of the work. Oh. So they can send the ship across the Pacific, pay for the work in the Chinese yard, Pay 50% duty on and the work. And it's still cheaper than the American shipyards, <laughs> all two of them. <laughs> and this is the problem. The reason that uh, McCain is focused on the build issue is because it's currently costing uh, about five times as much uh, as it would to build uh, a comparable ship in a South Korean or Japanese or Chinese yard. Yeah. Now, what, why is he here. doing this? What motivates him to do this? He's not from a state where there are shipyards. Uh, what, what makes this a, his pet project? Uh, he's really upset with the uh, 
the military uh, ship procurement programs. Which use American shipyards and which, which pay five times as much for the same ship. Uh, it's probably higher than that. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, the latest uh, supercarrier that was delivered, it's the, uh, uh, I forget the name of it. Anyway, that ship was way over, uh, a billion or more dollars over budget. A billion. And uh, was uh, almost two years late. And so these, the cost of these, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, warships is really going uh, through the roof. Doesn't have to, though. Uh, and that's, and these are the same shipyards. Well, not actually, there's, um, it's the same industry that's costing the merchant marine so much. Mm -hmm. And the rationale for keeping the build issue is that by uh, f forcing uh, merchant ship owners to purchase U.S. built vessels for the domestic trades, that will uh, help to, to uh, bolster our uh, shipyard industrial base for the purposes of military ship construction. Does that, does that work? Is it it's real, not really working, is? no. The costs are escalating both for the, on the commercial side and on the military side to such an extent that it, the, the whole rationale doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and what's the difference? We have it built overseas. We can supervise it the same way. It'll be the same plans, the same result. Right. Well, the, in the in the case of the of the of the civilian ships, uh, since uh, about 19, uh, 1990, all of the major ships built in the United States over a thousand, you know, self-propelled ships over a thousand gross tons, have all been designed in a foreign yard. And, the, bu and the, built here because of the Jones Act. The U.S. shipyards build under license. Mm. Mm. Of, oh, of, of people outside the country who designed the ship right. and who retain rights in the design. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's architecture, but it's not classified either. It's just architecture. Well, it's the engineering too. Mm -hmm. And uh, these uh, foreign shipyards not only do they design the vessels, but they also supply most of the equipment that's going to be installed on the vessel because they purchase in such much larger quantities. Propulsion, for example. Yeah, all the main engines are uh, built outside the United States. And steering. Uh, most of the steering. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of the stuff. Even the deck equipment. Yeah. Most of the deck equipment and some of the smaller equipments come from Europe. It's from a global world we live in. Sure. So, and, and I've seen those, uh, you know, Europe-built ships with the equipment. Some of the cruise ships here, they're beautiful. Of course they are, yeah. And they're first class, and, and the, they're and not American either. Right, and, uh, you know, the old argument was, well, Americans do such a much better job building ships that we can't possibly take these foreign ships. It's just not true anymore, uh, especially in terms of uh, with, all, with the International Maritime Organization, uh, the U.S. has entered into a large number of, tr of uh, treaties and conventions. Which set standards. Exactly. Which the U.S. abides by. Worldwide. Yes, yeah, everywhere. It's, it's yeah, everywhere. The, the same standards internationally. Yeah. Certainly, uh, you know, if you've got a, uh, a, uh, an inner island vessel in Indonesia, for example, that, that never goes on a foreign voyage. It doesn't have to be. Right. If you go on a foreign voyage, go to, go to the high seas, you're going to be following all those conventions and treaties. It doesn't matter what flag you fly. It doesn't matter what route you're on. If you're on an international voyage, you have to comply with all these and this rules. This is good. Safety of life at sea is exactly. What it is. That's part of it. Yeah, that's part of it. The safety of life at sea is one that. of those conferences. Uh, anyway, we we never really got into the question of what this uh, op-ed piece said or your response. We're going to do that right after the break. Okay. This is Mike Hansen, Shippers Council. We're talking about the Jones Act. We're talking about a, hmm, let's say, uh, a number of public statements made about the efficacy <coughs> of the Jones Act and about John McCain's <coughs> and about John McCain's bill, which was uh, put into Congress yet again in July. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you.
interesting situation. We're back with, uh, with Mike Hansen, and this is uh, uh, Making Leadership Work. We're talking about the Jones Act, we're talking about leadership in the Jones Act. And you have to give credit, actually, John McCain, for sticking on the point, for recognizing the right of it, and for putting that bill in over and over again anywhere he can to try to get it through. Unfortunately, he hasn't gotten it through, and there has been no reform, no relief for the Jones Act of any consequence in all these years. So now uh, this fellow Sacco from the SIU and other unions writes an op-ed piece, and you disagree with it. What did he say in the op-ed piece? Uh, basically, Michael Sacco, Sacco uh, uh, took the position that most of the maritime industry does, is that the Jones Act is an essential part of, uh, of the industry, and it's needed to protect the domestic industry from foreign competition. Shipbuilding. Uh, more the whole industry. Yeah, more broadly than just shipbuilding. And um, his union members are not involved in the construction of ships. His members uh, are the sailors who sail on the ships. Yeah. Nor are they involved in national defense, by the way. I would oh, add. no, they are. The members who sail on the ships? Sure. Because All carrying material. Right. But his members and some of the associated uh, unions of his uh, also work on the uh, military sea lift command ships. That's what I mean. Yeah. So they're, um, they're working on those ships. And they're also working on some of the ships in the uh, what's known as the U.S. flag international trade fleet, which is uh, subsidized by what's known as the maritime security um, program payments are basically operating subsidy payments of $5 million a year per ship. So he's, he's arguing with McCain. He says McCain's bill should not be passed. Right. What, what, and his reason is it's that McCain's he, bill would damage the American he ship wants industry. To, he wants to protect his members' jobs. Self-interest. Yeah. And uh, the irony of this is that if, uh, if we could use foreign-built U.S. flag ships in domestic trade, we would have a lot more shipping activity and therefore many more jobs for his union members. But he's unwilling to break with the, uh, uh, with the program as it's defined for the larger uh, Jones Act or U.S. maritime industry and start talking about uh, uh, oh, eliminating the build requirement. Many of his members actually s sail on ships that are foreign built U.S. flag, but they're regulated to the foreign trade of the United States. Right. Some of those ships are operated by MSC. Which is Military Sea Lift Military Sea Lift Command. They're actual government owned ships mm -hmm. that, uh, that the government contracts. They don't comply with Jones Act. How interesting. They can't carry, yeah, they can't carry domestic cargo. Yeah. And, um, there's a, and like I said, there's another fleet called the International Trade Fleet, U.S. flag International Trade Fleet, which is all foreign built, U.S. flag. About half are foreign owned through uh, specialized U.S. trusts. The, the truth is emerging that this is really silly with the Jones Act. Right. So he's got guys, lots of guys, working on a bunch of ships that are foreign built U.S. flag yeah. in the foreign trade. So the, his arguments are under, undermined by that. Sure. So now you wrote, you wrote back, you wrote in response, you wrote an op-ed piece yourself. What, what did you say there? Well, basically I said that um, he's cutting off his nose to spite his face because obvious, I mean, from my point of view, it's obvious that he could provide many more jobs for his uh, union members if, he were, if we were able to use foreign-built U.S. flag ships in domestic trade. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason for that is because... Uh, there's a far, wide, far greater variety of ships available from the international market, construction market. They're far cheaper, one-fifth the cost. And you can purchase newer designs than the licenses which are being sold to the U.S. shipyards. We would do better without the Jones Act. We here in Hawaii, we here in Puerto Rico, um, we here in any island, state, or territory would do better. The, the, bi the biggest problem with the Jones Act is the build issue. And that is connected to the national security argument that we have to maintain our U.S. 
uh, shipbuilding industrial base. All, all two shipyards. Uh, we've actually got uh, seven shipyards that can build large seagoing uh, uh, vessels. I, I recall hearing, by the way, that some of them are owned by foreign companies. Sure. Foreign, foreign owners. Yeah. That's uh, very ironic, isn't it? Uh, in a sense, yeah. But the uh, for uh, there's of the seven, uh, four are exclusively engaged in building military ships. The other th there's uh, two build only commercial, and one builds both. So. The argument that you need this to support the industrial base for military ships, yeah, there's one shipyard that does both. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so now, uh, putting this in the context of leadership, okay, it seems clear to me and to a lot of people I know, and certainly to you, that we'd be better off if we had some relief from the Jones Act after these hundred years of, uh, you know, retrograde kind of policy. This policy is no longer applicable. It, it, it never worked. It never was applicable. Yeah. And, and here we are with, you know, uh, special interests controlling the field on this policy. Right. Not, not, for, not for real good causes, not for uh, national interest anyway. So <clears throat> what we have, though, is we have a delegation of four, uh, four members, uh, yeah. members of Congress, two, rep two representatives and two senators, all of whom have taken the, uh, the position that the Jones Act should not be modified. There should be no change, no amendment, no relief for Hawaii, which, which needs and certainly could benefit by some relief on, on the shipbuild uh, requirement and other requirements to improve our economy. Uh, not only in the loaf of bread we buy, because Matson pays too much for these ships um, in, in American, American shipbuilding, um, but because there would be more ships plying the, plying the trade into coastal trade in Hawaii. And, and that would benefit our economy. Um, so where's the leadership on this? I mean, who is stepping up? Who is recognizing this? Or is it all a matter of influence by special interests? Uh, the, in, the special interests pay, play a very large role in all of this. Uh, the Den the uh, Democratic Party of Hawaii is pretty much lockstep in support of the, of the uh, Jones Act. I mean, that's, uh, this is uh, Isn't Senate, that like shooting ourselves in the foot. Senator Noy was a very strong supporter. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That was oh. so interesting. Um, uh, you know, he, um, he, he could have changed things, but didn't. Yeah. Uh, but he, he believed very deeply that uh, we needed to protect U.S. shipbuilding. But of course, we're doing that of the uh, 100 or so. Uh, Jones Act uh, ships. These are uh, seagoing, self-propelled seagoing vessels over a thousand gross tons. It's the fleet's uh, 97 vessels, something like that. And about half are employed in the what's known as the non-contiguous trades. Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. What's a non-contiguous trade? Uh, the what used to be referred to as the continental United States is now usually uh, called the contiguous U.S. Uh, continental didn't work because Alaska is actually continental. Mm -hmm. no, but no, it's not it's part of the same continent. But it's not <laughs> contiguous. Yeah. So you've got the contiguous U.S. or Kansas as the military refers to it. And then you've got the non-contiguous U.S. or non-Kansas. And those are... And so the, um, and it's actually in the uh, in the in the maritime laws. The uh, the trades to Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico are referred to as the non-contiguous trades. And uh, about half of the Jones Act vessels are employed in the non-contiguous trades. So, a very small population is really paying a lot for. The Jones Act. But in the contiguous trades. Oh, at, there's very little uh, Jones Act trading along the, along the coasts mm -hmm. in comparison to from, what? From Seattle to Portland to Los Angeles. Sure. That doesn't happen. It, to a very small extent. Yeah. And the reason for it is because Jones Act shipping is so expensive, it's not competitive with rail, truck, and pipeline. Right. Easy. So what about from Hawaii to the... To, it does affect Hawaii to the West Coast. Oh, this absolutely. It's very, very important for us. Yeah. Um, 
Actually, Matson uh, and Pasha do offer what's known as backhaul rates from Hawaii to the West Coast. So uh, I'm not sure that that's the real issue. The, the bigger issue is the rates from the West Coast to Hawaii. We pay more a for lot, that loaf yeah, of bread. Yeah. And um, for example, uh, because of the Jones Act, we don't, uh, we lost the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, flour mill recent, within the last year or so. And that, uh, that would bring in bulk grain and then mill, it, mill the grain here in Hawaii. Yeah. And of course, bulk shipping is far cheaper than shipping sure. in containers. Now, what about passengers? You know, um, what about the intercoastal trade among the islands in, in, uh, in Hawaii? Um, if we had a, 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 you have to have a Jones Act to do that intercoastal trade with those passengers, right? Right, the coastwise trade. Now, how come in Alaska you can take a foreign vessel, and there are a lot of foreign vessels in Alaska, um, moving millions of people through this season and a lot of times around the, around the, the calendar uh, from one port in Alaska to another? Why is that possible with non-Jones Act ships? Okay, first of all, uh, the Jones Act is when it's used very specifically, means Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. What governs the passenger trade is the Passenger Vessel Services Act of 1886. Mm -hmm. And the rules for handling cargo, the cabotage rules, for handling cargo are a little bit different than so those. Why can't I move one of these non-Jones Act ships from here to Kahului to Lihui and so forth? They do that. The foreign flag ships? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, because uh, there's, uh, there's allowances. Uh, what they normally do is they'll, uh, the foreign flag sh uh, cruise ships will sail from Los Angeles, stop in Ensenada, break the domestic voyage, and then proceed to several islands in Hawaii. And uh, they can get away with that because they've called on a foreign port. And they're doing the same thing in, in, uh, in Alaska by calling on a Canadian port. Like Vancouver. Or up the coast further. Yeah. Prince okay. Rupert or wherever. All right, so in terms of leadership, in terms of getting this thing tuned for Hawaii, for the benefit of Hawaii, especially for the, the West Coast to here, shipping that loaf of bread and so forth, um, who should be stepping up? This is the, you know, the, the seminal question for our discussion. Right. Um, uh, for, uh, for three years in a row, we had a resolution uh, introduced into the Hawaii State Legislature uh, detailing all of these arguments in favor of eliminating the build requirement for the non-contiguous trade. They have no power to do that, though. They have to make a recommendation to Congress by a resolu resolution. A resolution, yeah. But I mean, that was the, the vehicle we tried to use to begin to develop some support. Yeah. We did have some Democrats sign on, yeah. but we never had a hearing. and uh, Never got to committee. No. And thus it died. Yes. <laughs> okay. Why is the state legislature, and for that matter, the Democratic Party in general, against changes to the Jones Act? I mean, it sounds like they are siding with um, the unions? The, oh, the, uh, the unions are a very important... Uh, 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 Who's representing the people? Who's the, representing the consumers, Mike? The unions are a very important constituency of the Democratic Party. Well, sure, and, and they uh, ensure re-election. And one of the biggest unions is the ILWU. ILWU, of course, uh, is the longshoremen on the waterfront. The, those are the guys that take the cargo off the ship and put the cargo back on the ship. In addition, of course, they have some hotels and some other things that they've organized. Now, it doesn't matter from the stevedore's point of view whether or not the ship is US flag or foreign flag, they still exercise their jurisdiction on the wharf and get the work. Mm -hmm. So um, that, doesn't, that doesn't change for them at all. Who's representing the people? Who's representing you and me with our loaf of bread in the store? <laughs> uh, they're, the, 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 Democrat, the Democrats believe that they're representing their constituency. And the ILWU uh, is in lockstep with the SIU and the MMP, the Master Mates and Pilots, and 
and all the other unions, the sea, all the other maritime unions, to support the Jones Act in its current form. Um, I've had, I've had uh, discussions with union guys at different uh, places where I've done a presentation. And you explain to the, the guys who are basically sailors that we'll increase your job opportunities through this elimination of the, of the build requirement. And their response is, they don't care. They want to save the jobs in the shipyards that are existing now. It's a sort of sympathetic thing from one union sure. to another. Well, I mean, it's sad because we are paying much too much for loaf for bread as we are paying too much for occupancy of land. So this place becomes relatively more expensive than really any other state. Um, and there's nobody looking out to make a, a change. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've heard it before, and you can confirm it, that you don't have to throw the whole thing out. You can just tune it so that Hawaii has a better deal of it. Right. And, and, and yet still in the legislature and in the delegation, nobody wants to do that. Right. The, the simplest way to really affect change is to change the build requirement. And uh, we propose that it be just done for the non-contiguous trades because that's our interest. Uh, McCain is, Senator McCain has proposed it be done across the nation. Yeah. So that's a, a, there's a difference in the, in the So there's going to be a gubernatorial election coming up. You think this is a state uh, issue, a state platform issue? It should, well, uh, the Republican Party actually adopted our position, the Shippers Council's position, of eliminating the, the build requirement in the non-contiguous trades uh, several years ago. So that's part of the... Uh, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> part of the platform, but, you know, it's... Uh, uh, for example, um, the one Republican who has announced that he may run, he's going to run for uh, governor, the uh, member of the House from uh, Eva Beach. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think of his name right now, but he basically supports the Jones Act. Yeah. So. Okay, we got to go now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike Hansen, Shippers Council, a further discussion of the Jones Act and the relationship with the Jones Act and the need for change of the Jones Act to benefit Hawaii, and finally, the need for leadership to look over that. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Yeah.